So um, welcome everyone to uh, this session called Fascinating Fungi by Ben Devine, who's Nature Spot's uh, very own fungus expert. Uh, and without further ado, let me hand over to Ben. Uh, and uh, we're very much looking forward to your talk, Ben. Right, thank you very much, Alan. Um, and good evening, everyone. Thanks uh, for tuning in for my talk this evening. Um, it's going to be a, an overview of fascinating fungi. Um, it's going to, you know, a, a basic overview of what the kingdom of fungi is all about. Um, some basics about how to identify them. Uh, maybe a few stories about how interesting they are, and some pictures of how attractive they are, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm going to walk you through. It should take about half an hour, uh, 30, 40 minutes or so. And uh, I'll try not to get too carried away. It's a subject that I'm very passionate about this time of year, especially. We, we, we've, caught, we've timed this talk, especially for um, autumn, as you'd imagine, um, just to try and get people out there recording more fungi, really, and really enjoying what, everything that autumn has to offer. And so the contents of what I'm going to talk about this evening uh, are in front of you. So really, we're just going to start with the basics. And that's going to be what are, what are fungi? Um, I'm sure many of you know that, but it's just interesting to, to just say from the offset what fungi are and then moving on to how they function, because there is really important, you know, life wouldn't be possible without fungi. They are absolutely essential. Um, so we're going to have a think about that. And that's interesting because it makes you think more about their role in the ecosystems um, and it helps with identification as well, which I'll go on to talk about. Um, obviously, fungi are very useful as well to us, so I want to talk on that briefly. Um, and then really focus on a little bit more detail on the identification. So I've slanted this talk because it's for Nature Spot with a bit more of a, a view to helping you um, sort of troubleshooting the, the basics of fungi recording and, and trying to help you on your way and build some confidence there. Um, I think it's useful, it was for me at least, when I first started looking at some noteworthy groups, uh, some of the characteristic features to look out for to kind of help you. Um, so we'll touch on that too. And then some interesting species. There's so many interesting species to, to choose from. I've picked out some of my favourites that I've happened to encounter over the years. So I've got some, some photos and some stories to go with those as well. I've included something about eating fungi. It isn't something that I do much of. But I regard that as the kind of elephant in the room when I give my fungi talks or my walks, because it's pretty much the first thing everyone ever asks you. Um, you know, they'll hold up a, a specimen and say, can I eat this one? Can I eat this one? And then um, I have to quickly talk them out of it. So I'll try and talk you out of it this evening as well. But in all seriousness, there are some pitfalls and some tips as well. So I'll talk about those. And if we've got time, I'm sure we will. have. I've, I've included a short quiz as well. So you've got to pay attention the whole way through because there will be a test at the end. So I thought it would just be interesting to talk about um, a little bit about myself um, and my sort of interest in fungi and how that developed. So I kind of first became interested in, in fungi about eight years ago, I think it was, when I was studying at university. Um, and I, I sort of originally became interested in them for foraging for the pot. Um, and then quickly, as I realised, you know, how much there was to offer in terms of the sort of fungal flora, for want of a better word, um, I sort of moved away from picking them for the pot and just sort of wanted to understand them more. And then the recording became more of an interest to me. But these days, I, I, I virtually never forage them for the pot, actually. I just I often just leave them in situ just so other people can enjoy them, really. So, and as you can see, um, from the photos, I lead um, fungi walks, or we sometimes call them fungi forays, which is just a guided walk where everyone fans out into a woodland or a grassland um, to, to collect fungi and to identify them as a group. So it's a really nice thing to do this time of year. It's one of the things that I really enjoy doing, actually, um, leading these guided walks. Um, I, I often think of them as a sort of a bit of a treasure hunt, to be honest, where people get really excited when they find something special and um, it's a real joy of, of autumn and, and, and wildlife in Britain more, more generally, I think. Um, it's great as well because people bring me lots of interesting species this time of year and um, they see how excited I get when, when they bring things like giant puffballs, like these three big giant puffballs that were 
were given to me at my old uh, job in Warwickshire when I worked for the Wildlife Trust in Warwickshire. Uh, I remember the chief executive uh, came into the office this morning and he said, Ben, uh, I've driven past a, a mushroom on the side of the road uh, that looked like a big sheep just sat there. It was massive. Um, and uh, off I went to collect it immediately. And I came back with these three huge giant puffballs. So um, they fed the family for a few days, I'll tell you. So yeah, that's me. I'm interested in anything to do with mycology or the study of mushrooms, but generally all, all kinds of natural history, really generally. So what are fungi then? Um, well, fungi are actually their own biological kingdom. They are the fifth or fungal kingdom. So they are not plants, they are not animals, they are separate. And actually they're more closely related to um, animals than they are plants. And it's a massive a group of organisms in its own right. And the, the part of the mushroom that we see this time of year um, the, the fruiting body it is the, this characteristic toadstools uh, and other uh, shapes, cups and brackets that we see fruiting this time of year. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, fungi are actually much larger than that um, in the ecosystem. You have um, the, the sort of main mass of, of, of the, the fungus is, a, is actually a body of millions and millions of fine filaments called hyphae that, that bunch together to create this um, almost like a cotton wool like substance called mycelium. So it, often when you look in a, 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 um, a sample of soil, uh, if you look under a microscope, you'll see all of these high fee of mycelium all woven together. And this is the, 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 the sort of main mass of the, the fungi itself, separate from the fruiting organism that we tend to see uh, more of at this time of year. Of course, you do see fungi fruiting throughout the year as well. They are actually um, the world's largest organism, believe it or not. Um, these huge threads of hyphae and mycelium can carpet together in woodlands um, and other environments. Uh, and we think that the largest organism in the world is actually uh, a honey fungus in, um, I think it's Oregon State in, in the US. And uh, it's believed to be one continuous uh, species of honey fungus that that's, has a radius of 5.5 miles long. So absolutely colossal. And if anyone ever tells you in a pub quiz, um, you know, if anyone asks you uh, what the largest organism in the world, you can tell them actually, uh, it's not the blue whale, it's a honey fungus in Oregon State. So um, there you go. I always think that's an, an interesting one. So not only can they grow massive, um, they are actually ubiquitous, absolutely everywhere. Um, and we think that there's up to 1.5 million species worldwide, um, which is a, a huge amount of different species, but we're finding new ones all the time. And there's, you know, there's, there's lots and lots going on in the taxonomy of fungi. They're discovering lots of new species all the time. Uh, frustratingly, they change the names and put them in different uh, genera and they, they're constantly changing and evolving. It's a very dynamic area of natural history and taxonomy, I find. And just to give you a sense of how many that is in relation to, to plants, we think that there's five times as many species of fungi than there are plants in the world, uh, which is you know, very, very um, shocking. I think it's absolutely a huge amount. And, and in Britain alone, we think there's 12,000 species. Um, and I've spoken to the county recorder about this uh, recently, and he thinks it could be anything between 12 and 15,000. So. If I don't know the answer to your question, it's probably because there's so many species that I probably just, uh, no, one would, no one would know. But no, in all seriousness, um, they can be very challenging to, to record. Um, and, I'll, and I'll go through some, some of the pitfalls and tips of recording later. But I think it's just worth bearing in mind that there are so many and there are so, uh, so many that you have to use microscopes or mic microscopic features, spore analysis and that kind of things that actually um, it's okay just to say, well, I think that's uh, of this genus uh, and then perhaps move on and not, not be too worried about getting the exact species in a lot of the cases. And that's the way I, I am about it anyway. Um, just enjoy them really. So yeah, that's what fungi are in a nutshell. There's obviously a lot more to it and um, you can go into a lot of detail on this front, but sort of I'll leave it at that. I've tried to include in the talk as many pictures that I've taken myself 
Of course, there are one or two that, are, that aren't mine, but I think pretty much all of these are. And, and this was really, when I thought about, well, what is it that's so interesting about fungi? What can I show people? For me, it was just the kind of pure range of shapes and sizes, really, and the colours, uh, the textures and the forms. They're just some amazing things to look at. And they can bring so much colour to the, to, to the sort of autumn season. Um, whether it's things like corals or, or, or things like earth stars that you can see there, second in from the left on the top, um, or sulfur tufts, common species like those, um, things like um, southern brackets and amethyst deceivers. Some of the names are incredible. Um, this one here is called a parrot wax cap. It's a really nice one that you find in permanent pasture. Um, whether it's things like this chanterelle, or, or of course the, this, the, 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 the quintessential fly agaric um, toadstool that we, that we all know from, from folklore and cultural references. Um, I just think that the, the, the pure diversity and range of species to, to, to enjoy uh, is, is something to behold really. So I wanted to kind of show you that in that slide. So the key thing then is, is, you know, what do these organisms do in, in the environment? What, what are their roles? What are their ecological functions? And this is, where, this is where the ecologist in me gets really excited thinking about how these species interact with other organisms. And fungi are, are absolutely fascinating on that front, I think. And you often hear them broken into sort of three categories which I've listed here and I think this is actually quite a useful way to to think about them actually. Um, I guess the first one would be this this idea that they are sort of nature's recyclers or, or they are the decomposition um, organism in, 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 in a natural environment along with things like bacteria of course but fungi do actually break down a huge amount of organic matter and I did say I think at the start about how important fungi are for for um, for life as we know it, and they were they were one of the first organisms to evolve. We think so. Without without them, you know, we wouldn't be uh, the the earth wouldn't look the way it does. There would be mountains of uh, undecomposed matter all over the place. Um, so we need them purely for that sake, as, as as well as any other. But I like to think of them as these waste disposal units, and they, they are able to break interestingly um, break lignin down in wood. So they are able to break wood down into its um, component parts and recycle that nutrient back into the soil for it to be used uh, again and again. So remember the decomposers, sometimes referred to as the, the saprobes or saprobic fungi uh, that you'll read in the books. And the second one, and I've included the diagram to help me explain this and for you to perhaps understand this, is uh, I'm sure many of you gardeners in particular would be familiar with this, this function but it's this, the role of the mycorrhizal partners. Um, the mycorrhizae uh, are basically fungi that have these partnerships with, with, with trees and shrubs and plants where they have a, a symbiosis or a mutual partnership where they exchange nutrients and, and sugars and water and carbon and things like that with each other. So I've put in a, a diagram just to show you that the, the toadstool pictured on the on the ground level, it would have the the, the, the hyphae and the mycelium mats in the, in the soil that would basically coat the the fine roots of a tree or a shrub or a plant, and um, it would help that plant sort of uptake uh, uh, nutrients and water that the hyphae has microscopic access to in the soil, and it really helps the the, the plant. Um, grow you know it's responsible for a huge amount of the potential of, of lots of trees and someone once described um, without these mycorrhizal partnerships trees would be just really small and stunted they'd never really reach their true potential um, and of course in 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 um, exchange for this service if you like the the, the fungi are uh, given um, sugars from photosynthesis from 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 these trees and shrubs so in that case they are able to uh, exchange um 
you know these these um these nutrients and and, and have a mutualistic um benefit so i think i read that 90 percent of plants rely on on mycorrhizal associations and that equates to about 40 percent of all fungi uh, i think that was in britain that, that are mycorrhizae so a big proportion of of the uh, fungi we have are these these kind these uh, partners um, and then of course this is a much more controversial one um, is this idea that fungi can also be uh, parasites um, so i guess you could think of these as being species that weaken or even sometimes kill um, other living living organisms so even from things like you know athletes foot on a person or or things like um, ash dieback, you know, cholera, things like that. These are all parasites. But you see species like honey fungus. Uh, this is an arm armorillia species on the bottom left-hand corner. That's a classic parasite that you find in, in the woodland ecosystem where they, they kind of strangle the tree um, and um, using things, uh, I think they're called boot laces, uh, and they sort of sap the nutrients away. And, and it can often result in the tree, um, you know, declining and and, and in that process so they 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 are equally as important um you could say for obvious for obvious reasons you know we want that cycle of of, uh, of species living in, in harmony with each other and recycling back into the uh, ecosystem but they are um problematic sometimes because of things like global warming and um you know globalization moving plants around outside their home ranges and things it can present all si all kinds of problems which I'm sure many of you are aware of things like ash dieback is a big one that we're that we're talking a lot about now so really in a nutshell um we've got the decomposers the mycorrhizal partners and the parasites and when I do my fungi forays I often like to point out which which one's which I think that's quite useful okay so here's some examples so uh, the saprobic fungi, these are really common ones. I've included lots of common pictures um, in, in, throughout the talk, to be honest. So the turkey tail is, is one that you often find growing on sort of stumps of trees that have been felled or naturally fallen within, the, within a woodland. And the same is true of um, sulfur tuft. So the turkey tail, you, it's unmistakable really. It has this, this really sometimes colourful and beautiful um, sort of terraced fan structure. It looks like a, a, a turkey's tail. So, you know, it's, it's quite um, fittingly named in that respect, but it has these zones of, of different colours, sort of yellows and purples and browns. Um, and often you can see them on this picture. I think you can just see it actually. They don't, they don't stop growing. If, if there's a blade of grass or uh, a twig or something in the way they just kind of grow around it so they they um quite interesting to, to look at in a bit more detail if you see them often with these things they've all got their own stories associated with them i know for example that turkey tail um fungi is is actually used i think as a as a traditional uh chinese medicine and i think it has things like anti sort of carcinogenic properties so it, it's, you know, it's really a good one for, for for herbalists and things so i understand and then the sulfur tuft here, this is a, an unmistakable one um, that you find on, on stumps, etc. It has this really nice uh, sort of almost like a yellowy green tinge to the stem um, and this yellowy sulfurous cap that's quite unmistakable. And I, I understand this to be the most recorded uh, fungi on, on the, um, the forays that take place in Britain each year. This is the one that accounts on, on most of them or virtually all of them. So if you go out and, and try and look for this one, you're pretty much guaranteed to find it in a woodland. So that's some decomposers. Here's some uh, mycorrhizals. So we've got another common one is the brown roll rim on the left. And this is a very variable species, but if you, if you if you do pick it, you can turn it upside down and sure enough, the, the rim of, of the cap is, is rolled. It's always rolled um, around, along the cap margin. So you can't mistake it. And it has, it has very decurrent gills and we'll, we'll talk about 
some of these terms that I'm using uh, in, in later in the talk, but these are the features that can help you spot them. And this is one that grows often with birch, silver birch. You, you can always can always be sure to find it if you find enough birch. Um, and then another one is uh, one of the russulas or the brittle girl genus, and we'll talk about these as well. This is the ochre brittle girl. Uh, these can be very colourful, the brittle girls. Um, this is another one that grows with birch, I find, and you, you can find it, you can find it in a lot of places. And I think of the two yellow brittle girls that we get here in Leicester and Rutland, it's, uh, I'm, I understand that the ochre brittle girl is pretty much always the, uh, the contender. There's a much rarer version of it that's yellow as well, which, um, which I'm told does occur, but very infrequently. So here's some of the parasites. Um, I mentioned honey fungus briefly um, a few slides ago, but here it is. It's, it's honey coloured. It grows in these big tufts. And um, as I say, it can, it can leave telltale signs of its presence in woodlands. If you look for these, these black um, sort of boot laces that you find under the bark of tr fallen trees. So it's a good one to look out for. Uh, and this is a picture that I took in Northwest Leicestershire of a parasitic bowley. This is one that I've been looking for for a long time. And a few years ago, I happened to find lots of them in the same year. I think it was 2016. Um, and what you'll see with this, this little yellow bowley is it, it's parasitic, as the name suggests, but it parasitizes earth balls. So the, the organism on the right is a, is a common earth ball. And the parasitic bowley only parasitizes as earth balls. So you have to look for earth balls to find it. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll find one. But I was quite lucky this, on this occasion because I found growing on this bolete a, uh, a, a mold. It was like a, a bolete mold um, that you get, very bright yellow, a uh, very strange looking thing. But and then I had a bit of a moment when I discovered it because I figured out that actually this is a fungus, the mold, eating a fungus, the bolete, eating another fungus, the earth ball. So it's sort of three levels of par parasites all, or fungus all eating each other is incredible, really. So there you go. I mean, if you look, if you look carefully, you'll find these things and they've all often got um, stories to tell in their own right. So other uses of fungi. I've been trying to find a talk that I can put a pint of Guinness in for a long time. Um, so here it is, finally got there. Um, and you know, things like obviously yeasts um, are absolutely uh, essential for things like beer and nice cheeses and bread, of course, and wine. So, they, you know, fungi is incredibly useful to humans, I think, isn't it? As well as just being essential for life itself. We're able to derive all kinds of, um, you know, useful and enjoyable uh, products from it. Um, of course, things like penicillin. Um, as obviously a fungi as well, which is, you know, needless to say, incredibly important uh, for the human race. And um, we're finding as well, um, things like uh, packaging, uh, more, more, more so these days, fungi can be quite useful for um, alternative methods of packaging, you know, things like polystyrene, you can make sort of fungi alternatives. So here they've made a mold of, um, uh, you know, a wine, a wine box, maybe from something like sawdust or, you know, some waste product like coffee grounds or something, and just inoculated it with some mycelium um, and, and lay, allowed it to grow into the shape of, of, um, of whatever, it, you know, whether it's a packaging or something else. And then, of course, that once it's used, it's quite a robust thing. Once it's used, it can be uh, chucked on the compost heap and, and be recycled back into, back into the compost heap. So, there's lots of um, really innovative ways that people are using fungi that, that you find more and more about each day, sort of an almost like natural design cues and things. So I think we're going to see more of it. And it's just nice to think that, the, you know, that you can use the, the fungi in that way, really. Uh, so apparently corn products um, contain pretty much um, uh, mostly made out of fung fungal material, so I understand. Um, Meat-free products obviously contain a lot of fungi as well, as you'd probably imagine. And I've included um, some 
some mycorrhizal powders. I, I alluded to the fact that some of the gardeners will be aware of um, the mycorrhizal species. And that's because if you, want, if you want to give things like plants or trees or shrubs a bit of a boost when you, when you plant them, um, then you can dip them in mycorrhizal powders to accelerate that uh, uptake of um, these mutualistic organisms that will help will help them establish really and help them help them throughout the life. So, just a couple of really interesting uses for fungi, and just to kind of drive home the sort of ubiquitousness of them. I'm not sure how true this is, but a mycologist once told me that um, if you were to take a, a sample of, of of the palm of your hand. Um, you know, swab the palm of your hand, you might find as many as sort of 12 or, or so different types of fungi that were present on your hand at any given time. So the spores are just everywhere, you know, they're in every breath you breathe, they're just, it's completely uh, ubiquitous, as I say. Maybe if you were to sw swab your hands now in a kind of post-COVID situation, you might get a few less, but um, they are everywhere. Right, so moving on to the um identifying mushrooms so this is this is going to be a whistle stop tour really i want to give you some pointers and i'm sure you'll have questions about this um, at the end but really these are the key things that you need to look out for and i think my, my kind of key advice is just to get to get to know the the organisms and don't don't shy away shy away from interacting with them really so get up close to them have a look you know if there's lots of them take a specimen and and just get to look at the, the component parts, the anatomy of it, and it'll help you by looking at more and more of them, it'll help you um, develop a, an eye for them really. So, and that's obviously the same for any kind of species, isn't it? But um, the smell and taste I've put there as characteristics, some of them can have uh, very unique smells. Um, I've put taste with a, a star next to it, because of course you, you shouldn't taste all of them. Um, but actually I've seen some of these experts, so I don't do this, but they kind of nibble them and spit them out to see if they can taste various things. Um, so you wanna be looking for things like the cap, you know, what shape is the cap? What, um, what color is the cap? Does it have things like little spots on the cap? Uh, um, does it have uh, ridges or any other kind of characteristic on the cap? And the gills underneath the cap, does it have gills? Some of them don't have gills. Some of them are smooth and some of them have um, sort of tubular pores underneath instead of gills. So that can be a very good characteristic for identification. The stem or the stipe is another key characteristic. Is it a different color from the rest of the gills or the cap? Does it have a uh, fibrous uh, look to it? Does, it? does it stain when you rub it? Does it, you know, anything you can think of, just trying to understand the different kinds of shape and size and colour, et cetera, of the stems. Another key thing is, does it have a ring or does it have a veil, partial veil or, or a remnant veil attached uh, to, to the stem or the cap itself as well? And then this is a key one. I think I really want to drive this one home is, does it, does it grow out of a kind of bag, uh, sometimes submerged under the, just under the soil? And the bag's called a vulva. And there's a group of fungi called the amanitas that grow all grow out of this bag um, and they're the ones that you need to be really really conscious of because they're they're some of the most poisonous ones we've got so all these things together and then uh, the mycelium is listed there as well in the picture because the mycelium can sometimes according to color and other things tell you what species it might be as well the second thing and this is the thing that people often forget um, to, to su submit to nature spot is what kind of habitat uh, or substrate is the organism growing on. So if you if you take a photograph and submit it um, to, to Nature Spot, it's going to be uh, important to include that that information because, as I say, there are there are host specific fungi like the mycorrhizals that grow just with one species of tree. So, so to, to know that it was next to a beech tree or an oak tree is going to be really key information that should be included. Um, the same is true. Was it growing on? Was it growing on bare ground? Was it growing on bark chips? Was it growing on dead wood? Was it growing on uh, living material? So the substrate and the time of year as well, very important. So we get species that grow throughout the winter, less so um, compared to autumn, but then we also get spring fruiting species and also summer fruiting species as well. So that's going to be really key to helping the verifier 
and yourself um, understand what species it might be. And then lastly, this is for the um, very enthusiastic um, people that have microscopes as well and lots of money to spend on expensive keys and things for fungi. Um, you can take a spore print. So this is like a fungal footprint that basically you remove the stem. Um, let's take a conventional uh, mushroom shape, remove the stem uh, and then take the cap, a kind of semi-mature cap where the gills are, are, are nicely opened out and pop it on a piece of paper, uh, just like here on the photo, and then put like a cup over it so no drafts get under the gills for, for about 24 hours ideally or overnight will do. And then during that time, the, 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 the fungus will drop its spores and it will basically allow you to, as an amateur, tell you what color the, the spores are, which is very handy um, to help you further determine what it might be. But actually for the really keen people with microscopes, as I say, they can, they can separate those spores out and have a look at them under the microscope and that really helps. That's when you get into the kind of which of the 12,000 is it kind of territory, which, which I hear from experts can be really uh, arduous process to go through really hard. So I've kind of stayed off that for the time being, maybe one, maybe one for retirement or something. Um, so yeah, that in a nutshell is identifying mushrooms. I guess to say with Nature Spot, the key thing is getting photographs from all sides of the organism, you know, getting, getting if, if you have to remove them, then just taking pictures of all sides, noting things like substrate, smell, time of year, and maybe even spore color if you, that, if, if you want to take it to that level. Uh, while I'm talking about the spore prints, you can do a really nice thing, um, sort of arts and craft wise. You can collect lots of species and lay them out together on a piece of paper and then let them drop their spores overnight. And then you get like a beautiful kind of pattern of all the different colors. It's like a natural kind of artwork to do is a nice thing to do, especially with young people. I've done that a number of times. It's a really nice thing to do this time of year. So rattling on. So I'm going to talk about the anatomy in a little bit more detail here. I kind of should have, should have kind of talked around um, this, this slide as opposed to the other one. It's a bit more detailed, isn't it? But really, there's all different kinds of terminology to get lost in, like there is with all, with all natural history recording. But really, the basics are, are quite easy. It's, you know, what shape is the cap? What, um, what colour? What texture? Does it have scales? Um, the margin of the cap can be an identifier. You know, does it have things attached to it? Um, is it smooth? Is it is it uh, rippled or, or rough texture? And then the spores um, and the gills, as I mentioned, are all key. Um, the the spores, the, the gills can be really close together. They can be um, really far apart. They can be different sizes. They can be the same size. There's all, all manner of different combinations. And then the ring, does it have a ring? Sometimes the ring can be attached or it can be detachable. So you can move the ring up and down the stem or the stipe um, and then this this idea of the veil this is actually quite a nice photo to show a diagram to show you the kind of growth the conventional growth of, 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 a, of a mushroom in this case it's one of the amanitas because it grows out of the bag but you have this kind of veiled tissue over the um, the organism as it starts to grow and as it as the cap grows out of that um, it, the, the, the veil can sometimes remain attached like on the fly agaric species that we see and then often it can be weathered and and uh, brush off so sometimes whether it has a veil on it or not is a really key characteristic and I'm sure it's one of the things that people first notice when they see a mushroom is these spots on it or you know that kind of thing so yeah that's the basics of the uh, anatomy and this is quite handy um, this is from a website called the mushroom diary um, the, um, the chap, I forgot, I forget his name. I think it's Mark. He he gave me permission to use this slide. It's his his website, the Mushroom Diary. He's based in Leicestershire. It's a really good resource, and he's got these really neat diagrams um, showing different shapes and the names to go with them. So this is a good thing to take out into the field if you don't have in, this information in the key. Um, but it can be sort of campanulate, for example, or bell shaped. It can be conical or convex. Um, umbinate or flat uh, or depressed, these kind of things. And the, one of the tricky things about fungi, I find, is that this, the growth form just changes all the time. Some of them are always this shape 
and they don't change. They're not always conical, for example. Um, but actually, lots of them will change from conical to flat to umbonate. Um, so depending on what time you get them in the kind of growth cycle, they, they change. And the only way, and people say to me, how, how can you remember what that is? And it's just, just from looking at them for so long, really, just exposure to going out on walks and just trying to identify them in all different phases of their kind of life cycle. That's, that's only the way of doing it, I think, really. And likewise with the gills, the gills can be anything listed and anything in between here, really. So these some of the common ones. Uh, you get sort of adnate, which is gills widely attached to the stem. So we're looking here. We're looking at the uh, the stem. This is the spore producing surface here on the gills. And, you know, how much is it attached from the cap and the stems so are very much attached in this case. It could be adnexed or gills narrowly attached to the stem. Um, so you would have to obviously really look closely at these features to, to, to get a, a look. They could be free. So in this case, they're not touching the stem whatsoever, they're unattached. So it can be really hard to decide which of those it is, but really it's gonna be either this kind of um, side, it's gonna be attached to some degree, or it's gonna be really, really attached. So the, this is the one you find listed a lot, this idea of it being decurrent, and the gills just run all the way down the side of the stem, and there's lots of species that have that. Um, so you, you could go out and try and find um, some fungi that have the current gills quite easily. And likewise for, for adenate and adnex if you look as well. This is just to give you a flavour of the kind of things that we look out for. And if you could attach that information to a record on Nature Spot, then you'd be doing myself and Richard Eyelift that, that, that helps me do the verification uh, a big service because it'll help uh, hugely. So, um, in terms of collecting fungi, there are some useful tips. In, uh, usefully as well, there are actually um, some documents on the British Mycological Society website for this. And there's a code of conduct as well. Um, so if you really wanted to get into it, you could do, you know, read that. It's really useful. But, you know, the sort of things we're thinking about here are the basics, really. So obviously, best practice is to ask for the landowner permission. And really just try and minimise uh, damage to vegetation. That's that's going to be really important and try and leave as little impact as possible. Um, now, if it's a triple SI or a site of special scientific interest, then you have to get um, specific permission uh, from, I think it's Natural England um, and the landowner, and specifically the landowner, uh, to be able to, to, to collect on that land because it's obviously protected land. So... And some, some sites are protected as triple SIs because of the fungi that grow there. So obviously even more important, but I think things like wax cap fungi, there's some sites um, designated for the grassland wax cap fungi uh, in Britain and, and others as well for the rare species that grow there. Um, collecting for the pot, I mean, I'm not gonna go through this too much, but you know, just don't pick anything that you don't intend to eat, you know, and don't don't pick anything that you're not sure what it is, you know, it's just a waste. It's just a waste, and these things are important, and it's important that we leave them there for for a whole raft of reasons. Uh, this second one makes me laugh because it says don't collect rare red list species, but the trouble is, no one knows what the red list species rest list species look like anyway. Um, well, I certainly don't because you know they're some of them. I guess you probably do because they're quite characteristic, but on the whole, they they're very hard to to find. Collect only from plentiful populations, et cetera, et cetera. And then collect the young ones, the buttons, as opposed to the more mature. So don't collect the buttons, collect the more mature ones, that kind of stuff. Um, so some equipment that's useful to have is a camera. Because, you know, if we're, especially if we're recording on nature spot, that's going to be essential. But, you know, just to be able to get under the gills with a camera is really useful. And the same is true for a little pocket mirror. You can take a little pocket mirror with you and that helps. Um, leave the organism in situ and still be able to get a good handle on what the features are um, so it's useful just to, to take one of those out for taking pictures as well uh, a sturdy knife and a, a trug as well uh, for collecting so some noteworthy groups then um, I'm gonna I think it's four that I've picked out and these these are ones that are really good to get your eye in with and you know they're really charismatic groups that are quite easy to recognize once you know what you're looking out for so I'll start with 
the amanitas and these are the really important ones to know first because they contain some of the most deadly species that we have uh, there aren't there aren't that many deadly species so don't worry um about about recording them it's just important to be aware of some of them like the death cap for example which as the name suggests um it's not the kind of thing you want to be consuming that actually accounts as well so i understand for, for most of or virtually all of the deaths worldwide from consuming wild mushrooms so it's one that if you're ever going to know it's the one you need to know um and these these amanitas are uh, mycorrhizal species, so they grow with, with trees and shrubs, and they tend to grow in woodlands, both um, coniferous and deciduous. The spore print is white, and edit editability is absolutely no, but I am told that some of them, there's always, a, there's always a but, isn't there? But I am told that some of them are, there are um, uh, conflicting reports about, but I would just throw that completely out of the window and just say, yes, totally avoid them in that regard. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but there's some, some of them are quite bizarre. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to make a mistake with them. And the general features include the outer veil encloses the fruit body when young. So we mentioned this earlier about the, the veil that covers the cap as it grows. And a nice way to think about that is if you had a, a sort of a balloon, Imagine a balloon, a, a party balloon, and you were to sort of inflate it um, uh, two or three breaths, so it was just starting to inflate. And if you've got one piece of tissue paper and place that on top, uh, that would be like the veil on top of a mushroom. And if you continued, if you wet that tissue paper and then continue to blow the, the balloon up, you would imagine that that would break up, wouldn't it, into sort of component little fragments, um, and you'd be left with these these pieces still attached to the balloon when it was fully inflated. So you, that's a nice way to think about how these um, amanitas grow with their fail, often intact and often missing from the cap. And it, it can be as simple as it just weathering off, you know, it, rain can just wash them off and you're left with just a colorful cap in, in its place. Um, they have this vulva or this bag at the base of the toadstool, which is, which is really important. Sometimes you have to excavate the soil out to see it. They, um, they often have, they almost always have a ring on the stipe. Uh, and you can see that here nicely on the picture of the blusher on the right. They are free crowded gills. Usually they're host specific with particular trees and they are poisonous, some deadly so as I mentioned. So the Amanitas. Next one, this is one I, a group that I really like. These are a bit creepy, I think for some people. These are the um, ink caps. And these like to grow on decaying organic matter. You get them in parks, uh, gardens, churchyards. You see them a lot, I notice. Uh, lawns. Uh, tend to be, they are a woodland species as well as a grassland species, but just anywhere where you've got lots of decaying organic ma matter. They're saprobic, so they're, they are uh, recyclers. The editability is yes and no, because I'll talk about this later. Um, there are some that just you wouldn't want to go anywhere near, but they look really similar. Um, and the general features, um, they have closely spaced gills. They often break down into this kind of inky, uh, gooey kind of matter when mature. And I think the, the term that they use is the deliquesce. So they kind of melt into a, um, an inky residue when they finish dispersing their spores. Um, and then the veil, uh, sorry, the cap can have scales on, on them as well. You can see that nicely on the picture. And they sometimes have a ring on the stem, which you can see as well. So the ink caps is the second group that I want you to, to think about. And you, if you saw these, I'm sure you've seen lots of them before, actually, um, when you're out and about, but you, you can't miss them. They're all, they're all kind of quite interesting to look at. The next one is the brittle girls. Um, and these, I think these are quite easy to get your eye in with. They grow in woodland and they are mycorrhizal again. They're really colorful, lots of them. We don't get many of this species, the sickener. I didn't take this photograph, but I've included it because it's very, very colorful example of a, of a rustula or a, a brittle girl fungi. Um, editability is, they're not really a species that people pick because they kind of, as the name suggests, they kind of turn into a brittly crumbly kind of uh, mess when you touch them 
Um, it's a big group, hard to identify. So I think with very few exceptions, really, um, when we're recording these, uh, especially on nature spot as well, we, we just say rustula species because some of them we just would have to do the microscopy on to know. And it, that can be a, a challenging one to, to get to know really. This is, this is not the easiest group to get to, to know, but it's a nice um, genus to, to get your eye in with because there's lots of them and they're really attractive, bright colored, like I say. So the last one that I wanna leave you with for just to remember the groups is the wax caps. You get, tend to get these a little bit later in the season, sort of late October, November time. And some sites like um, uh, Alter Stones and Blacksmith Fields near Markham is a really good one for wax caps. And there's some really nice sites for wax caps, actually in Charmwood and elsewhere in Rutland and places. They like permanent grassland. So they're, they're really interesting because they, they only grow in areas that are kind of undisturbed, really. Um, they're a telltale sign of good habitat quality. So there are sort of what we call an indicator species. So if you've got lots of different wax caps growing in a meadow, then it tends to be a really good uh, continuous piece of habitat that hasn't been disturbed. I mean, they, they for example, they're intolerant for um, uh, soil conditioning, you know, so any nutrients or um, pesticides and things, any, any nasties that are added to a, a fragile grassland habitat, they, they don't they don't survive so only only a small amount do so you tend to have lots of wax caps in high quality um, uh, um, destinations so uh, the longshore estate in the peak district is, is a site that's i think is notified for its wax caps and if you go late in uh, this season to look for them it's a fantastic place to look for them you can often find dozens and dozens of different species so spore print is white um, really brightly colored and they're really waxy to touch and slimy as well they, they they call it a viscid cap so it's sort of some of them you pick them up and they sort of ping out of your hand straight away because they're so slimy um really interesting ones to look at and as, as i say indicators of good habitat quality so here's a nice example of one here and i guess it goes to show you what i was saying earlier about the variability of the same species often can be very variable that you would never think it was the same thing and the, the blackening wax caps a great example here it is on the right when it's young it has this conical cap uh, hence the the name conica hydrocybe conica um, but it as it matures it just turns black completely black um, you can sometimes i've picked it at forays and within half an hour it goes from colorful to pure black in in that short period of time so it's a really interesting one yeah, so look for that definitely if you want to go and try and get your eye in. So there's a few stories then um, of some interesting species that I, I think are worth mentioning. So I mentioned about the ink cap genus. Um, here's the shaggy ink cap, which is a, 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 a another name for it is the lawyer's wig, which I think is quite nice. It does look a bit like a lawyer's wig, doesn't it? And um, this is really interesting because um, it it has a it has an imposter. So there is a species called the common ink cap, which superficially looks quite similar, but once you start to look closely, it's a little bit different. Um, and apparently, the shaggy ink cap is a really good one for people to forage to eat. But the common ink cap um, is often mistaken, but it can lead to all kinds of problems. Uh, because if you apparently if you consume alcohol within I think it's something like 72 hours of consuming it um, it can put you in hospital because there's some compound in it that um, reacts with alcohol basically so yeah, there's caveats like that these are these are the kind of things that put me off um, you know collecting them for that reason and just I just enjoy them for their own sake you know but that's a really interesting one for people um, and the, another interesting story is the fly agaric the Amanita muscaria I put a picture of a reindeer there um, because there's all kinds of different stories, especially on the internet for um, potentially the uh, the origin of the story of Father Christmas and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And a lot of them put it down to the the story of the, um, the fly agarics and uh, apparently people consuming them in kind of nomadic tribes in Europe, in, you know, in, in uh, uh, in the prehistoric times uh, and then the story goes that they consumed them and because it's highly hallucinogenic they would um, 
they would feed them, apparently feed them to reindeer and then drink the wee from the reindeer. And um, that would help them uh, sort of have visions of reindeers flying around the sky with a, a big man with a big red suit on with a, lots of presents in his sleigh and all this kind of stuff. But um, you can get a really good version of that online. Um, there's all kinds of different iterations of it. But to think that, you know, some of these species are sort of have things like Christmas associated with them is a is an interesting quirk. So the, the just talking more about consumption, I think this is really interesting because uh, I understand this species here, the gentleman holding up the uh, Termitomyces titanicus is the largest edible mushroom in the world apparently and it grows on um, termite mounds in, um, I can't remember which part of Africa it is, but it's um, something to behold, absolutely a uh, massive thing and can be obviously a great find because it's obviously going to feed a lot of people. And then I put in a picture of um, probably the most highly prized sort of wild food that, that, that you can come across in Britain. That's the, the penny bun or the sep, uh, Boletus edulis. And, um, you know, that might be a counterpart, I guess, an equivalent, a British equivalent of such a, a, a prized kind of mushroom for, for its edibility sake. Um, I think the Italians refer to that one as porcini. So it's a super flavoursome um, version as, of a bolit. So here's a few more. Um, these are some amazing forms and bizarre um, strategies for, this, for their spore dispersal. Uh, this is the stink horn, the phallus impidicus. Um, and this is a picture that I took in, I think it was Outwoods, um, Northwest Leicestershire, sort of 2010, I think it was that sort of time. And to find them, you often you often smell them before you see them, and they've got a very characteristic, peculiar smell. Very unpleasant. And the cap, um, for want of a better word, cap grows out of this kind of ball shape. It's like an egg. They call it a witch's egg. And um, this kind of je jelly-like substance around uh, the, the margin. The, the stink corn appears from that. You can see the remnants of that here underneath. And then this, this kind of spore surface on the uh, spore producing surface here, it, it kind of, it smells absolutely terrible. And I think it kind of replicates sort of rotting flesh. Uh, obviously it's trying to get itself as high as it can in, uh, from the ground to, sm to sort of spread that smell around. And it attracts flies to the cap. Uh, and then the flies get covered in, spores and then the flies go elsewhere and, and spread spread the spores around so it's just a bizarre way to you know to to, to spread it so it's spores around the environment so apparently i'm told as well that the the center of the witch's egg is a delicacy in some parts of the world um but you wouldn't the smell so foul you wouldn't get me going anywhere near it really but apparently the the center sort of smells like almonds and it can be um quite appealing in some instances. There you go. And then this is a, a really interesting one, um, Clitheris archerii, the devil's fingers. And this is an example of um, an organism that has evolved in another part of the world. I think it's from Australasia, um, this species. So this is a, this is a non-native fungus that you can find growing, um, often on bark chips, like as pictured. And, um, you can see that this, this sort of equivalent of the witch's egg, but here, but the, the sort of tendrils that will burst from that and around the, the tendrils are these black, foul smelling um, spore producing surfaces that are really just filling the same ecological niche, but just from a different part of the world. And there's some amazing examples of these in rainforests, like with big nets over them and all kinds of funky shapes and colors, but they, they, they're intriguing things. And then um, when I was in Warwickshire working a number of years ago, um, someone came in and said, Ben, we found devil's fingers in a, um, a playground, a playground of it in a pub in uh, Warwick, I think it was. And sure enough, they, they had a bark chips delivered uh, for the, for the playground floor. And there was just hundreds of these devil's fingers all over the place. And I don't know sure what the kids must have thought. I mean, <laughs> it had a really interesting smell. Things like that, they're only small, but it's the bottom of the slide and the kids 
the kids sort of going down the slide and, and seeing these things must have been a bit terrifying for them. But yeah, if you see if you see one of those, really interesting. And I've not seen one since. They're sort of very uh, elusive. So I'm not going to I'm not going to um, dwell on this because it's not really what the talk's about. It's more about recording. But I guess the message is really just don't don't really go anywhere near a species in terms of consuming it unless you're a hundred percent sure. And the, the the thing is, people will tell you that there's um, you know there's rules and and things that you sort of general uh, golden rules that you can follow uh, that can help you on this front but they can't I mean it's just all hearsay really so I would avoid at all costs um, some of them are really good in that regard uh, like these and some are really bad like these so the one on the left is one of the amanitas so we know that because it has uh, white spores white gills crowded gills it's growing out of a bag it has a veil uh, this one here is called the Destroying Angel, which apparently gives you uh, an overwhelming sense of euphoria uh, before you die, uh, horrifically, apparently. And then the death cap is, you know, as I said earlier, uh, the one on the right, one to be aware of. Uh, and it's showing all those Amanita features really nicely there, isn't it? Um, because it's responsible for most of the world's fatalities. Some of them, and here's a nice picture of a brown roll rim on the right that's upside down. So you can see the, the rolled rim that I mentioned. Uh, some of them are less toxic, but will still in some instances be, instances be tricky, like the brown roll rim. And this, this one here is the, um, the yellow stainer, which looks like, it looks like the field mushroom or the horse mushroom, uh, but it, when you rub it, it turns yellow. Um, and it can be very upsetting for for your, for your tummy. So, yeah, I mean, again, I'm not I'm not promoting the foraging. But I just think it's fascinating to think of them within these kind of frames. To be honest, the, incidentally, the, the 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 round roll rim is in some cultures um, foraged quite extensively. But it has a quirk that if you eat enough of them over the course of your life, it can bioaccumulate and um, release its um, it's uh, toxins uh, when you get to later life if you eat enough of them so it can be really damaging in that regard. Right that was my whistle stop tour through fungi and uh, some of their quirks and how to record them but I want to give you a little uh, quiz now so 10 questions. Um, we're going to start easy it's a name that species quiz um, and then they're going to get a little bit more difficult as we go. You get bonus points for knowing the common names and the, the synonyms as well, because some of them have got uh, multiple names. And then also bonus names for, sorry, bonus points for knowing the scientific names as well. So obviously we're not going to mark them, but uh, have a go and then you can have a think about what kind of score you got at the end. So this is starting easy in my mind. So question one. I'll give you a few seconds. And the answer is fly agaric, Amanita muscaria. Question two. It's a nice one. It grows in troops like this often. And um, there's a, a closely looked species that, that you need to be careful of that I mentioned. The answer is Shaggy ink cap, AKA the lawyer's wig. So question three. This is often called the king of all wild foods, I think I said. And the Italians call them porcinis. The answer is the sep, bolitus edulis, or sometimes the penny bun. Question four, we haven't talked about this one, so there's gonna be some wild cards now. These can be quite persistent if you see them growing on, on trees, so you, they can last for months. Often see them in late summer, sometimes midsummer if the weather's right. The answer is chicken of the woods. 
um, and like the, the Latin name suggests, very sulfurous, um, vivid, yellowy, orangey colour, really nice one. Question five, halfway through. This is a famous one, we haven't mentioned this one. This is another decomposer and um, you often see it growing on ash. So if you were going to record this, you'd say this was growing on ash, uh, Ben. But actually, to be honest, there's nothing else that looks like this, so I probably wouldn't need that information. But I'll give you the answer anyway. King Alfred's Cakes. The other name they give for this is Cramp Balls. Okay, question six. This one's actually a little bit easier than the last one, I think. Uh, it grows in, the, in fans, it has that zonal growth rings um, in, in these kind of terraces that it grows in. Really attractive one, very colourful. The answer is turkey tail. Okay, question seven. I mentioned this genus in relation to how it can be an indicator of good permanent grassland but I didn't mention any of these ones. So this is perhaps one of the most colorful and very slimy. I said some of them can have this viscid, slimy cap. And this is one that if you pick up, it sometimes just falls out of your hand straight away because it's super slimy. And the answer is the parrot wax cap. Very colorful green. And it sometimes has, you can't see it well in that picture, but a kind of orange stem on it as well. Okay, getting towards the end now. So question eight, sort of emphasize this one, the, 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 the genus and the species in particular um, as being a really important one. And the name is self-explanatory, the death cap, Amanita phalloides. Can have this kind of greeny tinged um, darkening towards the center of the, uh, the cap look to it and it's not one that I find very often at all to be honest in this part of the, count, uh, the country but other parts of the country you see it a lot but that's not to say it's not common in other parts I'm sure it probably is but maybe some people can tell me in the questions at the end if they found that one I'd be interested to know this is one of my favorites this is one that you find in the woodland floor typically and it has another species that's very closely related that's brown i'll give you the name this one is the amethyst deceiver it's deceiver because it's very very um varied growth structure and two can just look totally different but the amethyst so the amethyst deceiver is very uh, purple so you can often um identify it correctly uh, and then the other one, the brown one's called the, the Deceiver, and it's very similar, but just brown. So it's hard to, hard to identify that one. And then the last question is this one. I saw quite a lot of these um, in Charnwood last year, and you get them on um, oak trees, typically. A really nice one. And it's one that I always um, have a close look at when I see it because of, of a symptom it has when you touch it. And the answer is beefsteak fungus or beefsteak mushroom. And, and what I was alluding to there is if you, if you uh, disturb it, it sometimes kind of bleeds like a sort of ready uh, liquid. So almost like a blood coming out of it. Amazing thing. Um, yeah, really nice one. So that's the end of my quiz. So how did you do? Um, well, if you got between one and four, then I'm afraid you're a fungal failure. And uh, but if you got between four and eight, you're a tolerable toadstool. And if you got between eight and ten, you're just a myco master. So well done if you got between eight and ten. Um, just to wrap up, then there are lots of ways you can get involved. If if fungi um, a fungi recording is is something that you're interested in, the best thing obviously is to get uh, a good guidebook and surround yourself with lots of fun, friendly people that know more about it than you do, like I did. Um, so I joined the Fungus Study Group for Leicester and Rutland. That's a lovely group, great, great group of really friendly people that are super helpful and, and um, a joy to spend a Sunday morning in the woods exploring with. Um, you can get a good guidebook. I'll give you a few tips, but this is the one I use, a, a Collins Complete Guide. It's a really good one um, for 
for beginners but actually you know i use it all the time now and i think i'll probably keep that one forever it's such a good book and that's a photographic guide so lots of them are illustrative but that's a photographic one so yeah you could join the fungus studio group you could all obviously get just get recording on nature spot so i would just recommend if you're not sure what it is you could submit it and put all the characteristic features down but you could just say um it's a an unknown species and we can try and help you identify it that way if you were unsure um, you could take part in National Fungus Day, which has just happened, I think, uh, this week and just gone, which was a virtual UK fungus day. It was really good. Um, and usually there's forays or mushroom events across the country that you can take part in. It's really fun. Uh, so have a look at that. And the, the videos are all on YouTube, I think, from, from that. So that's worth a look. Um, and just really just get out and about. My advice is just to get out and about and just really go out with, with um, you know, fungus on the mind and go and have a look um, and, and get to know these, these, these species and, and enjoy it in that way, just especially after it's rained. So it's been raining really badly, hasn't it, these last few days. And soon after heavy rainfall events is the best time to go and look. You tend to get a really big flush of, of, of fungi soon after a big rainfall event. So. I'd say this week and the weekend will be really, really worthwhile this time of year. Just quickly, a few resources. Um, the blue one in the middle is the one I held up. It's a really good one. I think it's about 10 pounds on, on um, the internet. The one on the left is a much more comprehensive guide. That's an illustrative guide. And I, I tend to use that um, less so, much less so but it's, it's got all of the known species in it. So it's really good to have. And then Roger Phillips mushrooms is another pictorial one. They don't, the species don't tend to be um, photographs. Sorry, the photographs don't tend to be of species in situ. They tend to be on a white background, which can be useful, I think. Uh, and then the websites, just want to draw yourself your eyes to the one at the bottom is the mushroom diary. That's the one I mentioned with the, the local chap who's got some really nice resources. So I recommend looking at that too. That's the end. So um, thank you very much. Hope that was interesting and you learned something and um, open to questions. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ben. That was uh, that was great. That was a really comprehensive uh, introduction. I hope that will uh, stimulate a lot of people to go out and get looking because, as you say, uh, we've had the perfect weather uh, this week and we've got a fine weekend. That's the time to go out and have a look. Yeah. Um, so has anyone got any questions for Ben? Has anyone brought any fungi along with them this evening <laughs> that they didn't buy in Sainsbury's? Preferably. Has anyone ever seen a death cap in close proximity? No. I, I, I don't think we've got any records for Devil's Fingers in Leicestershire and Rutland either, have we, Ben? Um, no, I don't think so, actually. Um, You've got lots of wood chip, and yet it's yeah, uh, weird. Yeah, it'd be one to go and look for. I think um, the I think it's Richard, isn't it, and um, Tom that, that, that managed the, the, the county database. Um, so we would need to check with them to see if there's any historic records, but I don't think there's any upon on Nature Spot now. So we've got a, a couple of questions in the uh, chat window. Um, uh, first one is about tar spot. So uh, there, there's various tar spot um, that appear on uh, leaves. Uh, sycamore tar spot, possibly the most common one. Um, so that's a fungus, Ben. I take it that's a parasite. Yeah, no, I would imagine. You, you, it, sycamore tends to cope really well with it, though, doesn't it? You can be completely riddled with it. and um it doesn't seem to kind of affect it too much it's an easy one to look out for you get these black um tar spots on the leaves but if you look really closely it's got a really bright yellow margin to it which people often don't think to look at but yeah you you tend to see that pretty much guaranteed on all all sycamore this time of year don't you and, and there are other tar spot fungi as well. Mm. So, um, uh, but I think they're pretty much host specific, aren't they? So it, it's important if you do record them to record the, the type of tree as well, uh, the name of the host. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and the same is true for usefully actually, um, or helpfully rather, for quite a lot of other species. So things like the rusts, um, 
they they host they tend to be host specific. So if you if you if you look in your garden, if you look under say like geranium or or you know honeysuckle or hollyhock and things like this, if you see a rust and growing at this time of year underneath it, then it's going to be the it's going to be that rust for that species. So that's really helpful. Um, and there's a question about um, ferrous sulfate and brittle brittle uh, brittle caps. Does it uh, stain them um, pink? I think uh, chemicals and stainings are, are a whole big area that you didn't have time to go into uh, in this talk, Ben. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. So some of them react to different chemicals and they can be really useful. I would, I would think of that personally as kind of very much intermediate bordering on sort of expert kind of territory really, because you, if you're wanting to use that kind of chemical to get a, a handle on what it is, you're gonna have to be really serious because you really wanna know what that is. And they only react with specific species, some of them. So I haven't gone down, for me, just sort of, Knowing the genus, and in most instances, knowing instances knowing um, what the key species are within each genus is enough. But as I say, it would require a lot more energy, and uh, sort of you'd have to get the keys. A lot of them, you would have to buy the keys to get to that stage to know which ones react and which ones don't. Um, so it's not 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 terribly useful, I think, for the uh, the amateur recorder but if you if you wanted to take it to that next level i mean the, the fungi study group have access to all that stuff and that's something they take on forays i know i mean some of the milk cap species for example um the lactarius um species they if you can you can use things like tissue paper to test the color of the uh the milk or the the um the, i think it's like a, a la latex that they that they um exude when you disturb the gills so there are there are given that kind of approach there are quick wins that you can do that don't require getting hold of chemicals and things if you follow me okay um have we got any more questions time for one more question possibly no you've you've covered everything then you've done the whole of the fungal kingdom that's brilliant <laughs> um i uh, thanks very much Bren, um, it, it's been a great talk, very, very timely. This is definitely the time of year to go and look. I hope you've inspired people to, to go looking. Um, hopefully, remember lots of photographs from uh, as many angles as you can. Um, and uh, any further details, smell, you know, host plants, all of that thing. Uh, so thanks very much, Ben. Thanks, everyone.